Hello, Michael. Testing one, two, three. Good evening, Bante. Good evening. How are you? Fine. Very good. Sean, can you hear me? Yes, Pant, I can hear you. Okay. How are you doing today? Yeah, uh, <laughs> better. Yeah. Every day I, um, I think, you know, I manage the day, I feel better. <laughs> you want me to... Pant, your video is not coming and uh, you want me to make me the host. Yeah. Yeah, I just turned my video off for a moment. Okay, this one. Very good. I can see you now. Yeah. But I think your left hand side light is not on for you on you. Oh, you, you notice that? I thought yes, something looked a little different, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll let turn it on. So I better. Of course, it won't last. I need to like everything else. So, uh, Chirasti, you, you heard about uh, the, the passing away of Jana Deepa, right? The Deshmukh, yes, Bhante, I told me. My, aunt told me. My, told, my aunt told me about it, yes, I heard. Yeah. It's quite moving. Okay. We saw those videos, uh, the pictures about that priest, Danish priest. Did you see the ones that uh, I had taken? Yeah, yeah, I think so, that's you, yeah. There was some, uh, yeah. yeah. There was a link uh, to yeah. the, uh, an article I wrote about him on my blog. Oh, okay, that we had 10 years ago, I, I had visited him and I had known him even when I first came to Sri Lanka. As a, as a new monk, I had met him and uh, we had some Dhamma discussions and he, he had inspired me. And uh, so I, I finally m met him again just uh, 10 years ago after a long, ha not having seen him. Which part of uh, Sri Lanka he, uh, he was, his uh, monastery where he was practicing? With well, he practiced, he, he was ordained at... Uh, Island Hermitage, but then he left there after a while. Uh -huh. yeah. Anyway, I think we are, it's time for us to start now. Right. Uh, <clears throat>
So we'll go ahead and uh, start by reciting the, for those who like, Namo Tassa and the Three Refuges. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Dhammaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Sangaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Dutiyampi buddhaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Dutiyampi dhammaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Dutiyampi sangaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Tatiyampi buddhaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Tatiyampi dhammaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Tatiyampi sangaṃ saranaṃ gacchāmi Welcome, friends, to this uh, Wednesday night uh, sutta class. And uh, <clears throat> the sutta this evening we are going to uh, be going over is uh, the Upali Sutta. Uh, that's number 56 in the Majme Nikaya. And I sent out the uh, and a link uh, to this sutra. I hope some of you uh, were able to uh, read through that. Uh, one person mentioned uh, <laughs> that she had uh, read it. And uh, Upale was a, a lay person, but he was a follower of a sort of, you could say, a rival sect, although the Buddha didn't really have consider his other people rivals, but uh, this uh, sect of the Niganta Nataputta, who was uh, the leader of the, I think, the, the, the Jain sect. But anyway, uh, so uh, <clears throat> one day, one of the disciples of this uh, Niganta Nataputta, his name was Diga Tapasi, it came to uh, 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 you know to see the Buddha after his alms round. He went to uh, see the the Buddha where he was uh, staying in uh, Pavarika's mango grove in uh, Nalanda, and so the. This uh, Tapasi, Niganta Tapasi, Diga Tapasi, after paying homage to the Buddha, uh, he kept uh, standing there. And the Buddha said to him, there are seats, Tapasi, sit down if you like. So Diga Tapasi took a low seat and then uh, the Buddha kind of straight away asked him a question. Normally people will sit down and you know, then they would ask the Buddha a question, but then the, the Buddha, you know, asked him a question, knowing that uh, his teacher, the Niganta Nataputta, taught uh, a form of karma that uh, the Buddha didn't agree with. And the Buddha uh, taught a, a different form of karma and the results. So the Buddha asked him, uh, about it. He says, uh, how many kinds of action does the Niganta Nataputta describe for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil action? And then the reply was this 
uh, Tapasi says, friend Gautama, the Niganta Nataputta is not accustomed to use the description action, action. The Niganta Nataputta is accustomed to using the description rod, rod. So now the, the three actions of or rods are basically the bodily rod, verbal rod, and mental rod. That means the body, speech, and mind. These are the three doorways through which we uh, perform uh, karma. And uh, then, then the Buddha says, okay, then, how many kind of rods does the Niganta Nataputta describe for the performance of evil action? And he replies, the Niganta Nataputta describes the three kinds of rod for the performance of evil action. That is the bodily rod, the verbal rod, and the mental rod. And then the Buddha Ask him, well, is the bodily rod one thing, the verbal rod another, and the mental rod still another? And the, this, the Pasi uh, replies to the Buddha, the bodily rod is one, the verbal rod is another, and the mental rod is still another. <clears throat> then the Buddha asks him, of these three kinds of rod, Tapasi, thus analyzed and distinguished, which kind of rod does the Niganta Nataputta describe as the most reprehensible for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil action? The bodily rod or the verbal rod or the mental rod? And the reply was, of these three kinds of rod, Thus analyzed and distinguished, the Niganta Nataputta describes the bodily rod as the most reprehensible for the performance of evil action, for the perpetration of evil action, and not so much the verbal rod and the mental rod. Then the Buddha replies, Do you say do you say the bodily rod, Tapasi? And he replies, Yes, friend, I say the bodily rod. And then the Buddha asks him a second time, do you say the bodily rod, Tapasi? And the Pasi <laughs> replies again, I say the bodily rod. And then the, the Buddha asks him a third time, do you say the bodily rod, Tapasi? And he replies, I say the bodily rod. Thus the Buddha made the diga to the Pasi maintain his statement up to the third time. So the Buddha used to repeat things three times. So he wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, Tapasi heard him correctly and he wanted to make sure that he heard the reply from uh, this uh, Tapasi. And so there, there'd be no uh, doubt or ambiguity about what he said. And so he's saying, his answer was that the karma by the body, let's say the, the actions of killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct, he said that those bodily actions have a, a more a stronger effect or more reprehensible, just the bodily actions than the mental actions. But of course, the body can't do anything without the mind telling it what to do. So it's the mind that actually is telling the body what to do. So in the Buddha's teaching, that the, the mind is the more powerful because it's the mind that actually, you know, makes the body uh, do those evil actions. But the Niganta uh, Nataputta, his belief in karma was that, no, just the bodily action itself has the stronger result. Now, in a way, you could say uh, that may be true because, you know, even in law, if you kill somebody, uh, 
you know, if you just think to kill somebody but don't do it, then, you know, you, you might not get caught for it. But if you actually you know, kill the person, then the result of the killing is, uh, you know, stronger than just uh, thinking about it in that way. But because the mind tells the body to kill and then you kill, it's really not the body uh, itself uh, that's uh, responsible for that. <laughs> It's, it's the mind. So this is what the Buddha, you know, according to the Buddhist teaching uh, about the karma. But because in uh, the Western law, you know, they don't believe in karma, of course, so they just, but, but intentional killing, of course, has a higher result than just uh, unintentional killing. So, uh, but uh, they'll address that uh, uh, shortly. So then this uh, Tapasi asked the Buddha, he said, and you friend Gautama, how many kinds of rod do you describe for the performance of evil action? And the Buddha replies, the Tathagata is not accustomed to use the description rod. The Tathagata is accustomed to use the description action action. And he says, okay, friend Gotama, how many kinds of action do you describe for the performance of evil action? And then he, the Buddha replies that he describes three kinds of action, the uh, bodily action, verbal action, and mental action. And that, uh, you know, the bodily action is one, verbal action is another, and the mental action is another. And then the Buddha replies that the mental action is, Tapasi asks him, asks him, which one is more reprehensible? And the Buddha says, mental action is more reprehensible uh, for the performance of evil action. And then Tapasi asks him three times, repeats that, did you say uh, the, the mental action? And the Buddha says, yes, and he, he repeats it in that same uh, way. And so he made the Buddha, you know, say that mental action is the most reprehensible for doing the evil actions. So then this, this uh, Tapasi gets up and he, he leaves the Buddha and he goes back to his teacher, to the Nigantanatta Putta. And he tells them, uh, you know, uh, well, the Niganta Nataputta sees this uh, Diga Tapasi coming and uh, says, where are, you, where are you coming from in the middle of the day? And he says, I'm coming from the presence of the recluse Gotama. He says, did you have some conversation with him? And he said, yes, I had some conversation. And then basically Tapasi repeats the whole conversation uh, with him. And, and about how that uh, Tapasi had said, no, the, he refuted, uh, he, con you know, he contradicted the Buddha and said, no, the bodily action is more reprehensible than the mental action for the doing of evil deeds. So the Niganta Nata put him, praises him and say, oh, that's very good. You know, you're a well-taught disciple. Uh, and and then while he's, uh, Niganta Nata put is praising this uh, Tapasi's uh, conversation with the Buddha, you know, uh, re repeating that the bodily uh, action is more reprehensible. And then there was a, this householder named Upali. This is where Upali comes in. Upali was sitting there listening to this. And Upali says, good, good, venerable sir. This Digiti Tapasi has answered 
the recluse Gotama, like a well-taught disciple who has learned the teacher's dispensation rightly. What does a trivial mental rod count for in comparison with the gross bodily rod? On the contrary, the bodily rod is the most reprehensible for the performance of evil action. And then the Supali, he's like, you know, quite uh, proud. He says, now, Venerable Sir, I shall go and refute the recluse Gotama's doctrine on the basis of this statement. And if the recluse Gotama maintains what the Diga Tapasi made him maintain, that the, the mental rod is more, this is very interesting, he says, just as a strong man might seize a long-haired ram by the hair and drag him to and drag him fro and drag him round about, so in my debate I will drag the recluse Gotama to and fro and round about, just as a strong brewer's workman might throw a big brewer's sieve into a deep water tank and taking it by the corners might drag it to and fro and around. So in debate, I will drag the recluse Gotama uh, all about. Just as a 60 year old elephant might plunge into a deep pond and enjoy playing the game of hemp washing. So I shall enjoy playing the game of hemp washing with the recluse Gotama. I shall go and refute the recluse Gotama's doctrine on the basis of this statement. So the Supali is quite bold, you know, and he, he's uh, overconfident that he can go and, and uh, but then the Tapasi who had actually gone and had that debate with the Buddha, he was standing by listening to this uh, Upali and he, he tells uh, Niganta Nataputta, I do not agree that Upali should go refute the recluse Gotama's doctrine. For the recluse Gotama is a magician and knows a converting magic by which he converts disciples of other sectarians. And then this uh, Niganta Nataputta says, it is impossible to pass. It cannot happen that the householder Upali should go over to discipleship under recluse Gotama. But it is possible it could happen that the recluse Gotama might become a disciple under the householder Upali. And so he tells Upali, go householder and refute the recluse Gotama's doctrine. Uh, and he tells him for the second time and a third time, it is impossible, it cannot happen that Upali should be converted by the Buddha, rather that the Buddha will be converted by uh, Upali's uh, debate. And so Upali again gets bolstered by that, uh, uh, you know, confirmation by this uh, Niganta Nataputta, thinking he can uh, re uh, refute the, the Buddha's uh, doctrine. So Upali comes to the Buddha and then uh, the, the Buddha asks him, or no, he asked the Buddha, did this uh, Diga Tapasi come here? And the Buddha replies, yes, Diga Tapasi came here, householder. And then he repeats the whole conversation <clears throat> that uh, Diga Tapasi uh, was uh, having with the Buddha. And he says, what does a trivial mental rod count for in comparison with the gross bodily rod? And then the Buddha asks the Supali, he says, householder, if you will debate on the basis of truth, we might have some conversation about this. I will debate on the basis of truth, venerable sir. So let us have some conversation about this. And so the 
the Buddha tells this to this uh, householder, Upali. What do you think, householder? If some uh, Niganta, that means disciple of this uh, Niganta, Nataputta, might be afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill, needing treatment by cold water, which his vows prohibit. And he might refuse cold water, though mentally longing for it. So they have this vow, I guess, uh, that they should not use hot water because they're, they're afraid if they boil water, it might kill some uh, invisible uh, microbes. And so they don't want to boil water, so they only use cold water for treating uh, their illnesses. But he would like to have uh, the hot water, mentally he would, but because of the vows, you know, they have their own monastic vows. Uh, just as Buddhist monks have their Vinaya rules, these uh, Nigantas had their own monastic uh, vows that they shouldn't use cold water. But so he, because uh, wait a minute. No, excuse me, I think I got that wrong. I'm sorry. It says uh, uh, they might uh, that this this uh, niganta might refuse the cold water and use only the permissible hot water. Because of this, he does not get cold water. He might die. Now, householder, where would the niganta not to put to describe his rebirth? He says, there are gods called mind bound. He would be reborn there. Why is that? Because when he died, he was still bound by attachment in the mind. So his attachment that he wanted cold water, but because of his vows, he could only use uh, the hot water. So because of that mind was still clinging to the idea of uh, cold water, uh, he might be born in this realm called mind bound. And so the Buddha then uh, asks him, householder, pay attention how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before, nor, is what you, nor does what you said before agree with what you said afterwards. Yet you made this statement. I will debate on the basis of truth. And, and then the Supali says, uh, though the, the Buddha has spoken thus, yet the bodily rod is still the most reprehensible for the performance of evil action. And then he gives him another little uh, uh, simile. The Nigantas might be restrained with four checks, curbed by all curbs, clamped by all curbs. And yet when going forward and returning, he brings about the destruction of many small living beings. What result does the Niganta Nataputta describe for him? And he says the Niganta Nataputta does not describe what is unintended as greatly reprehensible. So actually, one of the monastic vows of these uh, Nigantas was they would carry a broom with them. And they would sweep the ground in front of them so they wouldn't deliberately, you know, if they saw any ants crawling, they would sweep the ground so they wouldn't trod on them, thinking that they would, uh, if they stepped on it, that would be uh, an evil thing, I mean, even if they didn't know it, because the body uh, did it. Uh, so he's saying that unintended action uh, is not, uh, you know, reprehensible. Uh, but then the Buddha, if one intends it, householder, 
then it is greatly reprehensible. And then the Buddha, you know, asks him, under which of the three rods of the Niganta Nataputta describe volition householder? Under the mental rod. And the Buddha again says, pay attention, householder, how you reply. What you said afterwards does not agree with what you said before. And then, uh, then the Buddha gives another uh, little uh, kind of example. What do you think, householders? This town of Nalanda successful and prosperous? Yes, Venerable Sir, it is. And the Buddha says, What do you think, householders? Suppose a man came here brandishing a sword and spoke thus In one moment and in one instant, I will make all the living beings in this town kill them all into one uh, heap of flesh. Do you think the man would be able to do that? And Pali says, Venerable Sir, 10, 20, 30, 40, if even 50 men would not be able to kill all the living beings in this town in Nalanda into one mass of flesh. So what does a single trivial man count for? But then, then he says, suppose some recluse or Brahmin came here, possessed of supernormal power, attained a mastery of mind, and he spoke thus, I will reduce this town of Nalanda to ashes with one mental act of hate. What do you think, householder? Would such a recluse be able to do that? He says, yes. Such a recluse or Brahman, possessed of supernormal power and attained a mastery of mind, would be able to reduce you know, even 50 uh, people to ashes with one mental act of hate. Or even 40 or 50 towns the size of Nalanda he could reduce to, to ashes. And then the Buddha says again, pay attention how you reply. Uh, what you said before does not agree with what you said afterwards. Uh, he gives another example too, but I'm not going to, uh, you can read that if you want. Uh, so the Buddha gave these uh, four examples of how the, you know, the mind is more powerful uh, than the body and can do more destruction by the body. Of course, he was talking about, her, you know, uh, a monk who has psychic power, and there's probably not that many, <laughs> you know, people alive that uh, could develop that kind of psychic power and use it to, uh, you know, kill, uh, you know, people. So, but anyway, the the whole point was that the Buddha is, is saying that the mind is more powerful because it's the mind that makes the body do all these uh, things. Uh, and, you know, it's not separate from the body, which were the, these other uh, kind of people you know, believe, you know, their, their idea of the, the karma. So anyway, to make a long story short, the, the, uh, Uh, you know, after the Buddha's reply, the Upali says, Venerable Sir, I was satisfied and pleased by the Blessed One's very first simile. Nevertheless, I thought I would oppose the, the Blessed One, the Buddha, uh, and kept on kind of uh, uh, continuing the debate because he wanted to hear the Buddha's other uh, different replies to the same kind of question. And so essentially Upali, you know, becomes a disciple of the, the Buddha. Uh, he says, the, the, the Blessed One has made the Dhamma clear in many ways as though he were turning upright, what had been overthrown revealing what was hidden 
showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. And he, so he goes to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha uh, for life, he says. And then the Buddha tells him, investigate thoroughly, householder. It is good for such well-known people like you to investigate thoroughly. In other words, you should, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you know, accept what the Buddha said just because of those few examples, but to investigate the teaching even more. So because of that, Upali was even more satisfied. I'm even more satisfied and pleased with the Buddha for telling me that. Because other sectarians would, uh, if I became their disciple, they would carry them uh, a banner around the village saying, oh, look at so-and-so has come to me. Now they're, they're my disciple. But instead the Buddha says, investigate thoroughly. And so this uh, Upali had supported these Niganta Nataputas for a long time with alms and food and so on. Uh, and he tells Upali that, okay, you know, you might be going to refuge for me, but you, you have been supporting this Niganta Nataputta and you should continue to support them with food because they depend on you. In Upali again, he said, oh, I'm, now I'm even more pleased with the Buddha because you're telling me to continue to support this Niganta Nakti Buddha when I don't believe his doctrine anymore. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I understand yours. Yours is better. Uh, but anyway, Upali goes back home and he tells his servants not to give food to the disciples of Niganta Nataputta that come uh, to collect food. He says, I'm not going to give, we should not give any food to these, uh, these uh, ascetic disciples of Niganta Nataputta. I'm only going to give one to the Buddhists, only give food to the Buddhist uh, disciples. And then this Diga de Pasi, who initially had gone to the Buddha and had that conversation, he heard about Upali had become a disciple of the Buddha and is no longer <laughs> giving food to the disciples of Niganta Nataputta. And he, he went and told this to Niganta Nataputta. He said, it's impossible to Pasi. It cannot happen that the householder Upali should go become a disciple under the Buddha. In the second and third time. And uh, so Niganta Nataputta, you know, can't believe that this Upali would have been converted by the Buddha. And he tells us, dig it to Pasi to go to uh, Upali and ask him. And so this Digitapasi goes to Upali's house and the doorkeeper tells him to whoop. And the doorkeeper, you know, sees Tapasi there and says, wait, do not enter. From today, Upali has gone over to the, become a disciple of the Buddha. He closed his door to the Nigantas. And then Tapasi said, I do not need alms food, friend, he said. And then he, he realized that it was, was really true that Upali has uh, become a disciple of the Buddha. And so he goes back to this uh, Niganta Nataputta and tells him. And, uh, you know, again, he can't believe it. You know, he can't believe it. Uh, and so Niganta Nataputta goes to the Pali's house and the same thing they refused to let him in 
and uh, they say we're not giving uh, you any food. Uh, no, actually, it says that. Uh, Tell uh, Upali that I'm standing at the outer gate, and he wishes to see you. So we, they didn't let him in the house, but this Niganta Nataputra was standing at the outer gate. And uh, so he comes out there, and uh, but he he told him to come in. And anyway, they they finally they they come in and sit down. And then Upali goes into this, this hall and sits down on the highest, best seat and told the uh, doorkeeper to tell N this Niganta Nataputi to, to come in if he wishes. So, you know, before he was very respectable, respectful to Niganta Nataputi. But now he's, he's kind of very arrogant and he's sitting on a higher seat and telling this, his former teacher, oh, come in if you want, you know, and sit, and sit down. So Niganta Nataputi is like really, really uh, upset. Uh, and he asked him if he, he'd become a disciple of the Buddha, and he, he said, uh, <clears throat> yes. And then the Niganta Nataputa is interested in what he said. He said, Householder, you are mad. You are an imbecile. You went to the Gotama, the recluse Gotama, and said, I shall refute his doctrine. And you have come back caught by the vast net of his doctrine. Just as if a man, a man went to castrate someone and came back castrated himself. Just as if a man were, went to put out someone's eyes and came back with his own eyes put out. So you too, householder, went saying, I shall refute the recluse Gotama, and you have come back caught by the vast net of his doctrine. You have been converted by the recluse Gotama with his converting magic. And then the Supali tells Nagantanataputta, auspicious is that converting magic, venerable sir. Good is that converting magic. If my beloved kinsmen were to be converted by this conversion, it would lead to their welfare and happiness for a long time. And then he goes on to say, of all kings and ministers and then Brahmas and Maras and, you know, the whole of humanity or all beings. Uh, uh, Anyway, so there's some other things. I'm not going to read all the rest. You can read about it. But, uh, you know, Pali uh, recites uh, verses in praise of the Buddha. And uh, at, the, at the very end, and then Upali tells him, Venomous Sir, <coughs> Suppose there were a great, a great heap of many kinds of flowers and a clever garland maker or the garland maker's apprentice were to knot them into a colored garland. So too does the blessed one have many praiseworthy qualities, many hundreds of praiseworthy qualities. And, and at the end, this Niganta Nataputta was unable to bear the honor done to the Blessed One by Upali. And it means he was so jealous and angry that he said, hot blood then and there gushed from his mouth. Uh, and so this, this is a, a statement that has has also been mentioned in some other searches, but it refers to people that had so much intense anger and hatred, and animosity, you know, uh, toward the toward the Buddha. That uh, you know that had happened. So 
anyway, there was uh, last week we also, uh, you know, there was a similar sutta that gave this idea about, uh, you know, the Buddha is a magician and that he converted other disciples, but he did it with logic. You know, so those examples about how, you know, the, the mental, the mind is more powerful uh, than the body in, in the ultimate sense that, the, you know, the, the mind, if, if one had psychic power, one could uh, do a lot just with the mind, but the mind it, it also is telling, you know, the body what to do. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the more powerful thing. And even in Western law, that, yeah, if you commit murder, uh, but if it's premeditated murder, that means if you plan it out and think, that means using your mind, and then you uh, commit it, the karmic result is uh, more. If you kill unintentionally, like, uh, you know, in a fight and you push somebody and they accidentally, you know, fall and crack their head and die, you hadn't intended them to die, but they died. So the punishment would be less. So even in that example of Western law, it's showing that the premeditation and using the mind is more powerful than if you just do the action uh, without that uh, intention. So, uh, but, uh, so this, this sutta was interesting in, in, in just seeing how the, the Buddha, you know, used the logical reasoning and so on to, uh, to have these debates, uh, you know, with other types of uh, ascetics and uh, just the, the kind of things that go on with it, that went on at, at that uh, time. Okay, so uh, let's see if there's any uh, questions that might have come up from uh, about this. It says, what are the ways to restrain mental actions? Is it by observing our thoughts that come up during meditation that we can see through our mind and exercise restraint over our actions? Uh, yes, precisely. That means uh, mindfulness. I mean, basically the whole practice of the Dhamma is focused around uh, this, that it's, uh, you know, the mind that really is, it creates everything. And all actions of speech and body are preceded by the intention to do it. So by, by practicing mindfulness, uh, especially mindfulness of our thoughts and intentions, we can see the intention before it has uh, caused the body to do uh, the action. You see, normally we, we don't see the intentions because the intentions are arising deep in the, from the unconscious. And so we hear something unpleasant and you know, oftentimes we just immediately react, either like speaking some words or, uh, you know, with a, our bodily action, or, you know, the, even like, you know, you know, with, with the face and using the face and everything, which uh, shows what is in our minds, and, but using the body to express, right? So, uh, but we don't normally see those impulses. So the intention is like an impulse, right? Uh, you feel like, like the example of an itch. So you feel an unpleasant feeling and immediately you just, uh, you, you, you scratch it without really seeing the process, without really seeing that intention uh, because the process happens so quickly. So mindfulness, you would first become aware of the feeling. And by observing the feeling, then you see the intention. You can see the intention more clearly. If you wait a few moments. See, normally we don't wait very long. We just spontaneously react 
uh, when something happens to us that we don't like. And so uh, we don't see it re clearly in tension. So the, the mindfulness is, uh, provides for that being able to watch the sensation. By watching the sensation, you then see the intention more clearly that you don't like it. And then you have a, a, a brief, a period of time where you can contemplate it. Do I really need to react to this? Is it really that big of a deal? And using the right effort, you can let go of that, uh, that intention. Or as you, uh, while you're contemplating it, that intention might dissolve by itself where you realize the futility of, you know, doing that reaction. So, uh, yes, that's, that's about the only way. And that's why mindfulness, but, you know, again, we, the mind isn't easy to watch. I mean, the thoughts happen so subtly. That's why we practice mindfulness of the body and learn how to slow down and move a little bit more slowly. And by moving a little bit more slowly, we can more clearly see our uh, intentions. Uh, so like, for example, in walking meditation, when you walk really slowly, you know, you can see the desire to lift the foot up and to swing it forward, to put it down and so on. But when you're walking fast, just, there's no way you can really you know, see that. So the mindfulness of the body practice helps to uh, you know, be able to, by slowing down, you're able to see your thoughts. And also, as you're able to see the subtler sensations in the body, that helps you to see the subtler urges that are arising in the mind uh, before you've reacted to them. So the whole practice of mindfulness is about using the body to get in touch with the feelings, and then when you're paying attention to feelings, you can see the uh, mental states and the thoughts, which includes the urges and so on to, to do the actions. Uh, another question, when a thought to harm another happens, but one restrains oneself from doing so, to another thought, does that cancel out? Does the second thought cancel out the bad karma of the first thought? So yes, we replace a thought of ill will, for example, with a thought of metta. So the thought of metta or the opposite kind of thought, at least stops you from continuing to think the negative thoughts. So you're not creating more uh, karma. So, or you don't take action on the thought. Now, if you get, would continue to generate these negative thoughts, it might then issue forth in, a, in some kind of action of body or speech. But by checking those negative thoughts and re replacing them with the opposite type of uh, positive thoughts, you prevent that negative action happening. And the more you can do that, that's applying the right effort, your effort to abandon the unwholesome thought and to create and replace it with the wholesome thoughts. That's all part of the right effort. And if you are able to do that over and over again, then uh, gradually those negative thoughts will uh, get less and less. So uh, yeah, in, in the way our uh, positive thoughts can uh, cancel out the, the negative thoughts, uh, especially if we, uh, you know, repeat the positive ones over and over, enough and to make them so that they're automatic, they will gradually uh, eliminate the, the power of those uh, anusayas, those latent tendencies. 
but only with the attainment of the Magapala do you actually uproot the, uh, you know, greed and, and hatred. Uh, there's a saying, it's the very mind itself that leads the mind astray. Of the mind, do not be mindless. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's also true. I don't know if that was exactly said by the Buddha, but uh, could have been said by others. But uh, yes, that's why, you know, the, the first two verses of the Dhammapada are that mind is the, you know, all actions are led by the mind. Mind is their master, mind is their maker. Even all phenomena are led, created by the mind. And if you act or speak with an impure mind, then suffering follows. And if you act or speak with a pure mind, then happiness uh, will follow. Uh, this question uh, or this comment. Sometimes I feel as though thoughts arise randomly without any intention, as I don't feel compelled to take action. Is this possible or is the intention just dissipating very rapidly? Uh, I mean, some thoughts do uh, arise randomly without in intention. I mean, just a, a thought. You know, unless you're just sitting quietly and all of a sudden a thought pops into your mind. Uh, uh, and so there's no intention necessarily to think. And so one may not be compelled to take action. Uh, it's the intention just dissipating very rapidly. And intentions are very subtle. But, uh, you know, there could be some, some reason why the thought arose in the mind, but they're, they're so subtle that, uh, you know, we may not really know uh, the reason, but uh, it's, it's it's especially it's about the the intentions before your speech in action. Those are the ones we have to start with, and as you're able to prevent uh, the the actual negative actions of speech and body, as you can let go of those intentions, then uh, the intention to think. Uh, you you might be able to then see the intention to think. I mean, you, you can see the intention uh, uh, before thinking, uh, but it requires a very deep level of uh, mindfulness to do that. And that's why normally, you know, in the, in the uh, you know, in the precepts, in the... Uh, the, the silas are just stopping the the actions, those negative actions, and the ten unwholesome actions. Uh, but anyway, it's it's because it starts as a thought, but then there's time before it comes out of your mouth or comes out of your, you know, your body, so you can see them a little bit clear. But when it's just a mental thought itself. It takes a very deep level of awareness. Uh, we practice mindfulness of the body, feelings, sensations, and of the mind in meditation. How do we practice mindfulness of dhammas? What is a conditioned versus non-conditioned dhamma? Uh, well, what is the mindfulness of dhammas? It's recognizing the, the five hindrances. It's recognizing the five aggregates. And it's recognizing the, uh, the six senses. And that's dhamma nupasana. It's about understanding, you know, and understanding how the hindrances arise, how the, the five aggregates, uh, how they're, uh, interconnected, how we uh, cling to them and the, and, the, and the power and the grip that they have over our 
our, our mind in the six senses. So uh, that's how we, but again, the Dhammanopasana is the last of the four foundations of mindfulness. That's why we practice the first three first, because they're easier to practice. Only after practicing mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, and, and, and mindfulness of the mind, by that time we would have developed sufficient concentration and, and mindfulness to be able to then contemplate these uh, more mental phenomenon of the, uh, of the Dhammas. Now, what is a conditioned Dhamma? A conditioned Dhamma basically is everything. There's only one unconditioned Dhamma, and that is the Amata Dhamma, the Nibbana, the deathless state. Everything is conditioned. The five aggregates are also conditioned. Uh, the six senses are conditioned. So only Nibbana is the uh, unconditioned Dhamma. Everything else is, a, is a conditioned, really. So anyway, that's a big subject. Uh, you know, the mind is uh, the most mysterious thing and phenomena there is. And uh, it's only by developing, uh, you know, developing your concentration and mindfulness to a very high degree that you'll really be able to clearly, precisely see even the subtle intentions deep within the and the mind uh, uh, and so on. But uh, that's why we start with uh, the body and gradually work our way uh, into being able to see the mind itself. Okay, friends, uh, so I think uh, that will be enough for our discussion because uh, our hour is uh, up. So we want to take a short uh, break and uh, to use the restroom or take a drink of water. Then we'll come back to a few exercises and then have our uh, meditation practice. Okay. We'll see you back in a few minutes.
Okay, friends, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start uh, a few stretches in order to get grounded, centered in the body. So just stand straight, relax your shoulders. Feel the arms and hands hanging at the sides. Feel your feet pressing the floor. Gently close the eyes, try to mentally feel the height and the weight of the body over the feet. Then begin some deep, slow breathing. Try to take <clears throat> four or five or six seconds to slowly breathe in and hold the air in the lungs a few seconds. And feel the relaxing contraction of the out breath. So on the in-breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch the head back, arch your back a little bit. On the out-breath, turn the palms down, touch the top of the head. And again, in-breath, palms up, stretch the head back. Out breath, touch the top of the head. And third time, to hold that upward stretch longer. And release the fingers and the out breath, arms back to the sides. And relax. Just keep feeling the body, keep the mind centered, focused in the body. Feeling the body sensations, pulsations. Just gently close the eyes. And just mentally remember standing, standing the present moment of the body. And the next in breath, <clears throat> push up on the toes and raise the arms up over the head like this and stretch upwards facing the hands toward each other six inches apart. And the out breath, Come back down, heels to the floor, arms back to the sides. Use the breath to help lift and lower the body. Begin in breath, it's like blowing up a balloon, helium balloon. Out. Once more in. Out. Just keep feeling the body, subtle sensations or pulsations. Just feel where the clothing touches the skin. Just 
letting go of your thought. Okay, now spread the feet apart about three feet. Just let the hands rest on your, at your sides or below the hips. We're going to do side bending, keeping the legs apart. So breathe in. On an out breath, bend over your right side. Just let the right hand slide down below the knee. If you can, bend straight over the side. On the in breath, lift up. And the next out breath, the other side. In breath, lift up. Again to the right, out breath. In. Out. In. Once more. On the out breath, relax, close the eyes. Mentally feel the whole body, subtle pulsations. If you can't feel that, just feel where the clothing touches the skin in different places. Just present moment awareness. Now bring the hands up, press them together at the chest. And on an in-breath, raise the hands over the head. On the out-breath, lower the hands to the chest and bend your knees to lower down. Feel the stretch in the knees and the hips. The in-breath, come all the way back up, hands over the head. And an out-breath. Try to keep the back upright. In. Out. In. In. The out breath, arms back to the sides. Just feel the whole body. Feel each foot pressing the floor. Okay, now bring the legs and feet closer together. Just keep the feet a few inches apart. I'm going to do one last exercise. This is a, of a more powerful uh, backward and forward bending exercise. So you have to be careful with the back bends, especially when, when, you, when you come up from a back bend, when you're straightening up, it could be a, 
rush of energy coming up the body or the spine could cause you a little bit of shaking so or even to feel like you're going to pass out but uh, so don't bend back too far the first time but it starts by holding the, the palms outward like this and on an in breath you make a gradual v as you spread the arms out while bending backwards and bring the arms out to the horizontal position Try to look up at the ceiling and carefully lift up. And then at this point, you should be able to breathe out and on the out breath, lower the arms straight down to try to touch the floor by your feet. Try to keep the legs straight if you can and begin standing up. Turn the palms outward again, make the gradual V as you bend backwards. Lift up, keeping the arms out, then the out breath, lower the hands down to the floor. And third time, standing up, turn the palms outward, the gradual V with the arms. Lifting up, out breath. You're going to finish as you stand up, bring the hands together at the chest. And the out breath, arms back to the sides. Close the eyes, feel the whole body. Start to feel or imagine the whole body has been washed and bathed with healing life force vibrations, energy. Allowing the awareness to just rest in the middle of the present moment, connected with the body. Just feel the subtle vibrations, pulsations. Okay. Okay, so we'll uh, get ready for the sitting meditation.
Guess I'm going to turn my video off as usual. So try to sit straight. Once you place your hands, either one on top of the other in your lap or resting on your legs, sitting in a chair, try to keep the feet flat on the floor. Try to sit straight with the back and the the head in a straight line. Gently close your eyes. Just bring your total attention down to feel where your buttocks press the seat. Just feel that contact, that pressure, the buttocks pressing the floor. And feel your feet and toes. Now feel your hands and fingers. They touch together. Maybe touch your legs. Try to feel the outline of your thumbs or fingers. The subtle pulsations in the hands. And feel the shoulders, relax the shoulders, feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Feel where the clothing touches the skin of the shoulders, the arms, the chest. All these are this present moment sensation. And now feel the head balanced on top of the neck. And feel your face and sensations on your face. Feel where the lips touch together, where the upper lip touches the lower lip. And feel the tongue laying in the mouth. Feel the teeth, gums, even the saliva. Saliva is the water element. Tongue and teeth, the earth element. Earth vibration. Now feel the eyes and the sockets. 
and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. You might notice some color or light behind the eyes. might notice the subtle eye movements. Just relax the eyes. And from that point behind the eyes, let, let the awareness kind of expand back out to feel the outline of the sitting body. So all those different places we noticed. Let's try to feel them. the outline of the sitting body, the buttocks and feet underneath, the hands and arms in the middle at the sides, the head on top. And begin some deep, slow breathing to feel the more dynamic breathing process to help concentrate. And after breathing in, hold the air in the lungs a few moments and feel the relaxing contraction of the out breath. Let's take a few more deep, slow breaths, cultivating this basic mindfulness. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Now we're going to count the breaths from one to ten. Try to continue taking the deep, slow breaths to help you to concentrate and feel the body. So on the next expanding in breath, mentally count one. Feel the pause. And on the out breath, the contracting out breath, count one. Next expanding in breath two. Contracting out breath two. Next in breath three. Out breath three. In breath four. Out breath four.
in breath fine. Out breath fine. In breath six. Out breath six. In breath seven. Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath eight. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten. Now discontinue the controlled breathing. Just let the breathing return to its uncontrolled rhythm. We continue to feel it. Follow the movements with mindfulness, the subtler expanding and contracting sensations. Start to feel where the clothing rubs against the skin of the stomach, rib cage, your chest as it expands and contracts, producing friction, which is the sensations you feel. Try to feel the whole in-breath from beginning to end and the brief pause. Feel the whole contracting out-breath from beginning to end and the brief pause. Just knowing when the breath is coming in and knowing when the breath is going out. You know it by feeling it, feeling the sensations connected with the breathing. Just make that your primary focus of concentrated awareness. You can use these brief mental notes to remember Just breathing in, sitting, and breathing out, sitting. It's the ongoing continuous present moment of this body, sitting and breathing, sitting and breathing. Just remember that much, it's not much to remember. Breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, and the brief pauses between the breaths, feel the outline of the sitting body.
Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Feeling the body in the body. It's the body of breathing within the larger sitting body. It's like tuning a radio dial onto a certain frequency. Just tune the attention in the frequency of sitting and breathing. Sensations of breathing are there in the middle, but at the same time or in between, you can notice sensations on your buttocks or feet, the arms at the sides, the head on top. It's feeling the body in the body. With each out breath, let the awareness settle into the center of the breathing body. Just let the mind settle into the present moment. This breathing body is the connection to the present moment. This breathing body is the doorway for observing the feelings and thoughts, observing the mental activity, as thoughts and mental activity arise deep within the unconscious mind. If we're centered in the breathing body, we can more clearly see those intentions and thoughts arising. You see the urges that arise, the urge to move, even the urge to think, the intentions to move. Especially if unpleasant sensations arise, we can see that urge to want to get away from it. As we watch those urges, we can see any thoughts associated with that urges.
Be alert for thoughts sneaking up into the mind. Get caught up in thinkings, recognize it as thinking, thinkings. Gently let go of the thoughts. Take a deep, slow breath, bring the mind back into the body. Coming back to sitting, breathing. Sitting, breathing. Breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, sensations come and go, feelings come and go, thoughts come and go, sounds come and go. This is all just the continuous flow and change of the five aggregates of body and mind. But underneath all of that continuous change, the mental chaos is the silent dimension of the present moment, the connection, the natural connection to the present moment, represented by the breathing body. This breathing body is the lifeline to the present moment. If we lose that connection to the breathing body, then the mind gets easily lost and disturbed in various sensations. And thoughts, the past and future. Maintaining that concentration, connection to the breathing body creates the 
mental space or the buffer zone to observe the five aggregates. Just knowing that this is material form, material vibrations, pleasant, painful or neutral sensations, feelings. Perceptions, thoughts, and the consciousness, the ego consciousness. Is cultivating the detached, onlooking awareness of this breathing body, the flow of impermanence through the senses. And thought. The person of meditation is like sitting in a balcony seat with the movies, just watching the movie of this body sitting and breathing, thoughts coming and going, urges coming and going, painful, pleasant sensations coming and going. or watching the movie of the body and mind. The mind is calm enough with good awareness. You just try to get the feeling of this body being like an empty house with nobody home to answer the call, knocking on the doors and windows. Let the little I or me and the mind gradually fade away.
the mind has too many thoughts, if the mind is drowsy, sluggish, come back and take a few deep, slow breaths, reoxygenate the bloodstream, get regrounded, awake in the breathing body. Coming back to breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting. So when perception or ideas aroused in the mind from that sound vibration, Sambhi Sankara Anichati Yada Panyaya Pasati Atane Bindati Dukhi Esa Maggo Visu All conditioned things are impermanent. The five aggregates of this body, mind, and world, they arise only to pass away. When one understands this, sees this with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. Thus spoke 
Now let's spend the last few minutes of the meditation cultivating and radiating out thoughts of metta, friendliness, kindness, best wishes to ourself and all other beings. And a good way to do that is by combining it with some deep, slow breathing. So again, take a few some deep, slow breaths, and after breathing in, hold the air in the lungs for as long as you comfortably can to imagine or feel oxygen going into the blood, being carried out to all the cells of the body. Just imagine that as the metta going out to the cells of the body. And feel the Relaxation on the out breath, relaxing the mind into the present moment. Just take several more deep, slow breaths like that. This is like sending metta to your own body, mind, nervous system. So holding in the breath or to feel those little sensations of piti healing life force energy, relaxation on the out breath, sending your own body and mind metta vibrations. Just with the thought that may I be well, peaceful and wise, may I be free from greed, hatred, fear and ignorance. May I have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. May I be able to continue to deepen my understanding of Dhamma and the practice of meditation to free the mind from confusion and suffering. May I be well, peaceful, and wise. And continue to take some more deep, slow breaths. And with each out breath, just imagine sending these same thought vibrations, best wishes back home to your parents and family, wherever they might be, or to wherever you live, your roommate friends, your colleagues at work, just with each out best. Just imagine those waves of metta going outward to them. If you know anybody who is particularly suffering or having problems, you can send them a few breathfuls of metta on the out breath. Just imagine those vibrations of the body permeating the body, minds, and nervous systems. Pure love, pure wisdom, pure energy. Soothing the fires and the pains of suffering, greed, hatred, and delusion. And then with each out breath, just imagine these waves of metta going out across the fields and valleys to the towns and cities. Eventually across the whole earth, across the oceans, and surrounding the whole earth. These ideas that May all living beings, wherever they might be, be well, peaceful, and wise, free from greed, hatred, fear, and ignorance. May all beings have the patience, strength, mindfulness, and wisdom to meet and overcome all difficulties in life. 
May all beings be able to hear the teachings of the Dhamma, learn and practice meditation to help free their minds from confusion and suffering. May all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together, understanding the ultimate interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. It's like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and And now to finish this meditation, I invite you to join in chanting the word sadhu three times. Chant very slowly on, on the out breath, long out breath, chanting the sadhu. You take a deep in breath. Sadhu Place the hands at the edge of your knees. Now the next in breath, stretch your head back and pull the hands against the knees to arch your lower spine. Hold it a few moments. Feel the sensation. Then lift the head up and on an out breath, Press the chin to the top of the chest to stretch the neck vertebrae. And lift the head up on an in-breath. And relax on the out-breath. Put a smile on your face. Okay, friends, so that brings our Wednesday evening sutta study and meditation to an end. And uh, so during this week, during the week, uh, try to reflect on that idea that the mind is, you know, the most powerful thing for doing unskillful actions even though we do them with the body it's our mind that's 
making the body do things that we might then regret or worry about and, and so on. And just remember that in mindfulness, the day keeps dukkha away. That means practicing the M&Ms in between maybe your longer morning and evening meditations or to continue to stop every hour for one minute, come back to the body, the present moment, take a couple of deep breaths, send out metta to forgive anybody that might have crossed you or hurt you in the last hour, or forgive yourself if you did something unmindfully. Also, the sutta day keeps delusion away, so try to read the sutta. Okay, so I uh, wish you all the best. And uh, well, just as a reminder, uh, on Saturday we have the, well, I'm going to be conducting a, a homestay DOM, a day of mindfulness over the Zoom, but it's not with my link. As I sent out a, a link that's being hosted by the Pittsburgh Buddhist Vihara. Uh, 